Joseph Bilby was born in Newark. He is the uh, editor and author of more than 400 articles and 19 books on New Jersey and military history. He has a military background himself, serving as a lieutenant in Vietnam. Joe, thank you for your service. Thank you. Mr. Bilby has received the Jane Clayton Award for contributions to Monmouth County uh, history and an award of merit from the New Jersey Historical Commission for his contributions to the state's military history. Tonight, our presenter will reveal the remarkable history of submarines off the coast of New Jersey. What I'm going to do is go back and discuss New Jersey's relationship with submarines before we get up to the World War I and World War II business. And um, let's see, hopefully this will work. Yes, it is. So, all right. The first submarine connected with New Jersey really is Bushnell's Turtle. Now, a guy named Bushnell was a, a captain in the Revolutionary War Army, and in 1776, when um, the British fleet came to New York and George Washington's army was sort of semi-besieged there, uh, the British fleet was in the, in the harbor and he came up with the idea for a submarine, a, a device that would looks like an avocado, sort of. And uh, it's, it was made out of wood and the, as you can see, it was manually powered and the person who was powering it would go up to a British ship unbeknownst to the British on board in the dark and drill a hole in the ship and place an explosive charge in there and blow it up and sink the ship. George Washington was a little dubious. Uh, George turned out to be more or less correct, as he often was. Uh, but he said, go ahead. What have we got to lose? You know, we're, we're going to not be here very long anyway. So the guy tried it. They actually did get up to a ship, drill a hole, and then the guy ran into uh, a metal obstacle of some kind. Some say it was the sheathing on the hull. Some say it was a piece of iron that was there. And it never materialized. At any rate, when the Americans evacuated New York shortly thereafter, uh, they put this thing on a ship and they sent it to uh, New Jersey, to Fort Lee. And the ship sunk at Fort Lee. So I tell people the first submarine in New Jersey history is somewhere near the base of the George Washington Bridge in Fort Lee. Now, what you see on the left is a model of this ship. She has it. She really should have it up this way. But uh, it belonged to Franklin D. Roosevelt. And uh, it was part of his private collection of artifacts. He had once been Secretary of the Navy. And so they brought it out for an, antiques, uh, an arts and antiques show in New York in sep September of 1945. Where it is now, I don't know. It may be up at, um, you know, in New York. OK. Now, there's a lot of fooling around with submarines. There, there was, in Europe, uh, in, in in the, even in the Middle Ages, there was a renaissance, actually. People came up with ideas. There's no real evidence any of them were ever, ever materialized. I cover those in the book. But for America, the first, the Civil War comes along, and you have the Confederates want a submarine because they want to sink Union ships and break the blockade. The Union wants a submarine, but they want to actually use this submarine to go into Charleston Harbor, remove obstacles so the fleet can then steam in and shell the city. The first one they come up with is one called the Alligator. It's developed in Philadelphia by a slightly shady character. Uh, and he, uh, uh, he, he, he sells it to the Navy. They test it in the Delaware River and some of the creeks down in South Jersey. Sort of works. They bring it down to the Virginia Peninsula in June of 1862. And they're a little nervous about it. And they say, well, maybe the Confederates will capture it. So they bring it back to Philadelphia. Then they say, well, we're going to bring it to Charleston, because that's where we really need it. And it's manually powered by guys cranking. And so they, they tow it to Charleston, but it never gets there. Somewhere off of Cape Hatteras, there's a storm. The tow line is broken, and it sinks, and nobody's found it since. So that brings us to the next guy. Uh, this submarine is called the Intelligent Whale. We actually have this down in Seagirt in the National Guard Museum, where I work part time my part-time retirement job as a historian down there. And it was invented by a guy named Merriam in Connecticut. And he came to New Jersey because New Jersey, Newark especially, was a very big industrial uh, city at the time. And he also, there was some money here, and he, he was looking for investors. And investors put the money up. Most of the submarine was built in Newark. And then they had to sell it to the Navy, though. That was the problem. 
uh, after the first one didn't go well, but they figured we'll give it a test. And in 1864 in the summer, they brought it into the Hudson River, and the thing is supposed to submerge, and then a door opens in the bottom, and a diver comes out, removes obstructions and mines in front. The reason the thing doesn't sink is because the air pressure inside exceeds the water pressure outside. Well, that actually worked. It went up, it came down, the guy came out, he went back in again. But the Navy looking at it said, well, yeah, remember the alligator. This thing looks even less seaworthy than the alligator was, so I think we'll give it a pass. But now the guy that they had hired to sell it was this guy. When you wanted to sell something in the Civil War, you went to this guy. This guy is Oliver Halstead, and he was a Newark attorney, and in 1861, uh, he managed to come down to a long branch where Mary Lincoln was spending the summer and insinuate himself into her entourage. So, and then he went on to Washington with them. And it got to be, if you wanted to sell something to the Union Army or the Union Navy, you had to see Oliver. Oliver was the first big time lobbyist. You could sell, he could sell anything. Plus he knew the family. And so the investors had hired him and he could not get this, the Navy to buy this thing. This is the first thing Oliver couldn't sell. So some of the stuff he sold was very good, some of the stuff not so good, by the way. He bought it. And in the spring of 1865, he went in to see Abraham Lincoln. He could do that because he knew Mary. And he said, if you make me a Navy officer and make my son a Navy officer, we'll take this submarine up the James River to Richmond. And Lincoln says, well, that's not a bad idea. Why don't you go down and talk to General Grant? He's down there besieging Richmond and Petersburg. He goes down to see Grant. The war's over. Now he's stuck with this thing. So what does he do? He docks it on the Passaic River in Newark by the Hughes and Phillips Machine Company. Now, according to legend, he takes it out for a cruise. It's manually powered. You've got four guys cranking. And he cruises up and down the Passaic on an occasion. Then he tries to sell it again. And the first person you want to try to, people you want to try to sell a submarine to in the 19th century are the Irish. And in 1866 and 67, you have the the Irish Republican Brotherhood has an insurrection that fails, as most of them did up until the end, the last one, in, uh, in Ireland. And the Irish Republican Brotherhood's American branch, the Fenian Society, they actually invade Canada and defeat the Canadian militia in a battle. And then they say, well, what do, you do? What do we do now? You know, Well, let's go back to, to Buffalo and have a drink. And uh, they leave. You know, but, so the organization isn't the best in the world. Well, he calls General Sweeney, who's a Civil War general who's in charge of the military arm of the Fenians. He comes down to Newark and looks at this thing, and he said, nah, we want something that can sink ships. You know, so so that, that they turn him down. So finally, the Navy buys it at a discount, and they bring it over to Brooklyn, put it in the Navy Yard. And around 1870, they decide, well, we'll try it out, and it doesn't work. So someone says, well, go back to Newark and see that guy, Halstead. You know, he knows how to, he used to take pleasure cruises on the Passaic with it. Whether that's true or not, we really don't know. But they go back to Newark to find Oliver, and they can't find him because he's dead. So why is Oliver dead? Oliver was a big family man. He had a wife and ten kids. He also had a girlfriend. And he put her in an apartment above a saloon on South Street in Newark. I had a naval archaeologist come over to see the, to see the, the submarine once at, at, at Seagirt, and he went to go up to Newark and find the spot where Oliver... Oliver got shot by her other boyfriend. And uh, it was the trial of the century in Newark when they got this guy. As a matter of fact, the newspapers went into such great detail about how he was hanged because it was a new method. You know, it's, it's remarkable to read newspapers. I love reading old newspapers. <laughs> At any rate, so now the Navy's stuck with it. What do they do? Well, they make an lawn ornament on the Brooklyn Navy Yard commander's lawn. And when they close the Brooklyn Navy Yard, it goes down to uh, Washington Navy Yard. About 15 years ago, the guy who was in charge of the Washington Navy Yard calls the curator, uh, a warrant officer named Judy McCabe, who was in charge of the museum in Seagirt, and he says, I have this New Jersey artifact. We're overwhelmed with stuff here since Brooklyn sent down. Do you guys want it on permanent loan? So she said, yeah, sure. So they came up, brought it up, to, they took, trucked it up to Seagirt, and they had to take the roof off the building, <laughs> insert it in there, and we have it to this day. So. That's what, it's actually the only surviving Civil War submarine, aside from the Confederate one they dug up out of Charleston Harbor. So, 
Now, the next submarine comes along, and we go back to the Irish again. Uh, John Holland, who is a, um, he's born in Ireland, he's a teacher, and in 1864, when he's a kid, he reads the Scientific American article on the intelligent whale. And says, so, oh, that's interesting. And then he becomes a teacher, and his family immigrates to the United States. And he ends up in Patterson as a school teacher. But he's a self-taught engineer. And he invents a little submarine in 1878 that has a little diesel engine in it. And he actually tests it out in the Passaic River, and it sort of works. So then he goes to the Fenians. His brother's an officer in the Fenians. And he said, I know you guys like submarines. And uh, you, know, you fund me, and I'll invent one that works. So they do, and he does. And he gets this submarine, which is, the newspapers know the Fenians put up the money. They call it the Fenian Ram. And he tries it out and he, he, in Jersey City, and it works. And he, they, he goes up to Coney Island, down to Sandy Hook. The thing actually works. It sails. It's got a diesel engine. He works with a guy to develop a gun on it, and they almost blow a fisherman off a dock in Jersey City, but, you know, but it works. So then the Fenians start arguing with each other, and two factions arise, and one faction steals the submarine. They tow it to Connecticut and stick it in a barn. Now, Holland gets totally disgusted, and he, he says, you people are a disgrace to the nationalist movement, and I want no more part of you. I'm going to have good regular investors to invest in my next project, which he does. And eventually, he sells, in 1900, he sells the first submarine to the United States Navy. He has nothing more to do with the Fenian. Meanwhile, the Fenian Ram sits in Connecticut in a barn. 1916, the insurrection in Dublin, they bring it out and bring it into Madison Square Garden, where they charge admission for, as a fundraiser to see this thing for the, for the people that survived the, the 1916 rising. And then it goes after that, it goes up to a Bronx high school where it sits on the lawn, Maritime High School in the Bronx. 1926, a guy from Patterson says, that belongs in Patterson. It was invented in New Jersey. And he lived in Patterson, and he lived in Newark later, too. But the guy buys it, and he brings it back to Patterson, where they put it in Westside Park. This photograph's taken in 1940. But it sits there from the 20s all the way through until not that long ago. Uh, and it becomes a photo magnet. Everybody gets their picture taken. You go on eBay and type in, you know, uh, a Fenian Ram and, see, and, and, see, and put photographs. You can always picture smiling snapshots of people standing by this up in Westside Park in Patterson. Now it's in the Patterson Museum. So that, that's, the, that's the next step in submarines in New Jersey. And here's the actual one that he completed, and that was actually, and there he is, looking up out of it. That's, that's John Holland uh, looking curiously. And, and ironically, John Holland dies in August 1914. And there, his obituary in the New York Times, I think it was, says, wow, it's a, too bad he wouldn't live, didn't live to see this war that's starting in Europe because I think his, we think his invention was going to really yeah, be a, a, a major participant in the conflict. Well, yeah, they were right. But he died in August of 1914. And that brings us to the Germans. Uh, the Germans had a submarine fleet, but the, submar the, the, the combat submarines that they had, the U-boats, couldn't make it to the United States. Well, they didn't really have to initially. They were around Britain. But they also developed what they call cargo submarines, much larger. And the cargo submarines were intended to go out underneath the British blockading fleet uh, and then come to America and buy war material. Now, we were officially neutral, but we sold plenty of war material, and New Jersey made more explosives than any state in the Union during that, and places blew up all over the place. Uh, but it was, um, most of it went to the Allies. Uh, but they did manage to go to Baltimore a couple of times with this submarine, and there's the crew of the Deutschland, of this super, super submarine. And they loaded up with war material and brought it all the way back to New Jersey successfully, or back to Germany successfully. So. Once we get into the war, someone gets the idea, hmm, if those ships, those submarines can reach the American coast, then let's militarize them, and we will use them to harass the Americans. And they did. And the primarily one, the one they did it with is U-151. And there's 
if that, that's a U-151 class, it may be the actual U-151, or, but there are only like a dozen or so of them made. And that's it, that's it, photograph was taken in Germany. Now, the main objective, when the, in 1918, they finally get the submarine, U-151 comes to American waters. And they start down around the Virginia Capes, and they basically sow mines. Now, when they want to stop a ship, uh, these aren't military ships. These are, you know, local coastal ships. They, 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 uh, they surface, and the ship stops. And then a guy gets in a boat and goes over to the, from the submarine and goes over to the ship, and he gets on board, and he says, may I see your papers? They take their papers, and he says, we're going to blow the ship up. Uh, get in the lifeboats and row for the shore. And that's what they do. They don't torpedo ships. Uh, part of it's to do with so the rules of war. Uh, if it's a pure merchant ship, we had that whole bit with the Lusitania in 1915. Of course, the Lusitania was carrying weapons down in the hold. Now we know that today. But this is the kind of mine they would drop. They would drop, and they worked their way up to Delaware Bay. And that's a framework there, and that whole thing would go to the bottom. And then the round ball, which is the explosive device, would be cut loose but on a chain. And the, anch the, the frame would anchor it to the, to the bottom of the ocean, and the, would, the, the mount itself would go up to where a ship could hit it. Because they didn't want them floating all over the place. They wanted them in various locations. So they mined Delaware Bay. They, they, they came up and took some mines off the Jersey coast. They tried to cut the Atlantic Cable. Uh, and then they destroyed six ships in one Sunday off the New Jersey coast, and it was called Black Sunday. And this is the guy who would come on your boat. That's Lieutenant Corner, and one of the captains of the ships that uh, that he uh, that they blew up said he was so polite it was annoying. So, oh, may I have your papers, please? And uh, and uh, he actually survived the war and was interviewed in 1929. And when he said that, he said, well, the next war comes, America will not be that safe from submarines. Of course, he was right. But uh, he was the boarding officer because he spoke perfect English. That's one of the sloops that they, they blew up. And this is, this is a German submarine, and they're watching the people in the boats that got off the ship go by. He would say the New, the New Jersey coast is that way, row. And there weren't any, there was only one small group of casualties from all of this, these six ships, and it was, on, they stopped, the biggest, biggest ship they stopped was an ocean liner called the Carolina. And one of the, one of the lifeboats from there got knocked over by a wave on their way in. One of the boats comes up in Atlantic City Beach in June. The tourist season started and all these people were you know, a lifeboat comes up in the beach. In Asbury Park, it became a tourist event. Once they found out the submarine was out there, they were, had blimps up there, and they had airplanes flying to try and find it. And everybody rushes down to the boardwalk. The Asbury Park press says it was like a big festivity day, because they were watching the planes. Oh, maybe they'll catch them out here. And it, people didn't take it as seriously as they should have. World War II, they do, because it ruins the tourist trade. Uh, going through... Uh, up to, up to 1939, we have the Neutra Neutrality Act when war starts in Europe. And the Neutrality Act says that we cannot uh, engage in combat uh, and we're not going to have armed ships. But in 1941, in November, they amend it and they start putting artillery pieces, four and five inch guns, on merchant ships. This is Hoboken. A lot of them were done in Hoboken. And you would get a crew of Navy guys along with this. They called them the Armed Guard. And their job was if a submarine were to surface, they would shoot at it with this, this gun. And of course, a few weeks later, we were at war. And this guy here, he was in charge of what they called the Eastern Sea Frontier. The Eastern Sea Frontier was from Florida all the way up. He was headquartered in New York, Admiral Andrews. Andrews knew there was going to be trouble right away. I mean, he was no dope. And he said he, uh, he wanted uh, 
convoys along the coast. He wanted more anti-submarine uh, activity. However, he had to deal with so this, one, this is one of the boats they had. Is this was a trial PT boat, and they just gave them any kind of anything they had left over. That was down in Cape May. That's what he had to work with. But he had to work with this guy, Admiral King. Now, there's an anecdote, and I don't know that it's true, but it's nice, that Dwight Eisenhower said once, if King ever worked for me, I would have had to shoot him. <laughs> and uh, he was, a, he immediately says the war is going to be in the Pacific, ships all the destroyers that were the best destroyers out to the Pacific. He tells Andrews, you don't need coastal convoys. All you need to do is send a destroyer out to chase submarines. Andrews says, I don't think so. The British say such and such. He doesn't like the British. He served with the British Navy. They put him, made attachment to the British Navy in World War I. For some reason, he didn't like them. And the British were offering us uh, advice on how to do coastal convoys. Nope. So the Germans decide that they're going to sink oil tankers in the Gulf of Mexico all the way up the coast of New York. And they send over submarines. Now, the British know they're coming because the British have broken the code, the German code. So in late December, they tell Andrews uh, their submarines heading for, the, heading for the east coast of the United States. So he does what he could, and it's not a lot. But King just won't listen to him. There's a German sub. Now, their ordinary submarine can reach the, the coast of the United States by 1942. So in January, in January of 1942, we get the first sinking of a ship, and it's a Norwegian ship. So in Norway was taken over by the Nazis, but there were a lot of merchant ships at sea, and they established an office in New York, and they still continued to work for the Allies. It's called the Varanger, off Atlantic City. It was an oil tanker. It was torpedoed. It was the first one, the end of January 1942, the first ship sunk off in New Jersey. And ironically, or, or almost a miracle, the entire crew survives, including the dog who was a mascot, that, that they were very, very lucky guys. And... That's the ship going down. These, these paper, by the way, these pictures got all got in the newspaper. These are, you know, there was no censorship. King forgot about that. Oh, you know, but, and uh, thanks to these guys. This is Dewey Conchetti, who's a fisherman, and his mate, Edward Elisano. They're coming out of Atlantic City to go fishing, commercial fishing, early in the morning. And they see, I hear a boom up in the distance and see a flash. And it's that ship being torpedoed. So they keep on going, and he comes across lifeboats out there, pulling for the shore. So he gets these lifeboats and tows them with his fishing boat. And he calls other fishing captains, and they, they, they tow all these guys in. They all survive. And uh, they bring them into the Atlantic City Coast Guard Station. And there they are. They brought them over to Gloucester to the immigration people, and they check, checked them out for injuries and, for, uh, and fed them. Now, the next ship to go is this one, the R.P. Resor. This is off of uh, another tanker, an American one this time, and it has an armed guard on it. It has Navy guys on it. It's 42 guys in the crew, I think, and eight, eight Navy, eight sailors. Now, this picture was taken by journalists who went out to Menisquan Inlet on a boat. This thing burned for several days out there and made the papers. You know. So, uh, but at any rate, the, this ship, these are the two luckiest guys on the Jersey Shore uh, in, in the end of February. In the, and they're, they're the only survivors of the RP Resort. Uh, the guy on the left is a sailor. The guy on the right was a, a merchant seaman. They were the only two survivors. And they, the Coast Guard guys who pulled them in said that their bodies were so soaked with oil it took four guys to get one of them over the gunnel. Because it was just that they were all... And the beaches started clogging up with oil and wreckage and an occasional body uh, as, this, as we went into the spring. 
by March, the Navy says, well, we're going to start censoring this stuff, you know, uh, so that the Germans don't know what they're, you know. But in the meantime, all, all of this stuff is in the papers. And here you go. Uh, after the sinking of the resor, Andrews does what King tells him to. He sends a destroyer out. And the destroyer is a ja Jacob Jones. And the Jacob Jones goes down the coast, passes the RP Resort, goes down to Cape May, where it's torpedoed by the same submarine that torpedoed the Resort. Only 11 guys out of 110, I believe, survive. And one of the terrible problems here was the boat was torpedoed, and as it sank, guys in lifeboats it had depth charges, which they had, they had armed. So when they reached a certain depth, they went off. So the guys in lifeboats are above it, and it's sinking, and it reaches that depth, and boom and killed with their own depth charges. But this is a California newspaper. Now, there you go. Big headline. Blast the boy torpedoes, only 11 saved. So this goes on into the spring. And uh, there's another ship, the, the Cabra, which was a Brazilian liner. And uh, they, this is a lifeboat that they, they managed, the Coast Guard actually brought them into Connecticut, although it was sunk off Sandy Hook. And again, this is a news conference with these two ladies in, in, in Manhattan. They, they notice they have a microphone there, reporters are interviewing them. Uh, that's the woman and her daughter who were on the Cairo and who survived. And. Uh, <clears throat> And this is another unfortunate guy. The Gulf Trade was another one that went down. And Cap Captain Toger Ol Olson owned, was the captain. He survived, but then he died later on in an accidental crash with another tanker. Interestingly, when I, I, I'm going through this, doing the research for the book, and all these guys are named Olson. And so when I do the final chapter, which is a reflection on what happens after the war, I go down and interview a guy down in, in Island Beach who's a, the, a mayor of Barnegat, I think it was. And uh, his name is Olson. And he's a, uh, a commercial fisherman. And he had actually trawled up a torpedo in the 1960s. And so I said, all these guys are named like, you know, oh, you, they're all Scandinavian. And he says, yeah, they were. They really were. Now, now, finally, the Navy begins to get it. And they want volunteers from all over the place. This is a party boat out of the AC, but this, this is before the war. But they're only small boats. They have yachts out there. Ernest Hemingway was down in, in, in Cuba with, uh, you know. And then you had uh, uh, Civil Air Patrol was found in Lakehurst and lots of civilian volunteers spotting for. And then they finally begin to do coastal convoys. You know, Andrews finally gets, gets his way. And then it starts to, it starts to taper off. And uh, the Navy claims, by the way, that summer that they sunk 12 German submarines. The actual number of submarines they sunk? Zero. <laughs> they didn't sink any. These are the blimps at Lakehurst. And they had uh, machine guns, 50 caliber machine guns and depth charges. So once this starts to get going, however, uh, and then the last one is in, I think it's in late July or August of 42, you have... Uh, uh, they have uh, a ship is torpedoed and the submarine is chased by blimps and they drop depth charges and it's damaged and ironically a, 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 a grammar school teacher brings her 8th grade class out to watch on the beach yeah, and it's there, all this stuff is going on out there but uh, that's a depth charge going off by the way that's probably the most effective anti-submarine warfare they also have troops on the beach. You know, why do they have troops on the beach? That's not going to do anything about submarines. Well, in 42 also, these submarines that came over here, they landed some German agents. Now, you hear all these myth stories about guys who, oh, yeah, you know, my grandfather was sitting in a bar, and a guy next to him had come in from a German submarine. You know, that's all false. But, but four agents, uh, four uh, saboteurs were dropped in Long Island and four in Florida. And... The Coast, Guard, the Coast Guard guy who was patrolling had a nightstick. So uh, he, they, they all spoke fluent English because they had all been born, they'd been raised here and then gone back to Germany with their parents thought Hitler was such a great guy. And 
so they knew the slang. You know, you see these World War II movies, you know, the guy who, who won the World Series last year and all that stuff. Well, these guys knew, you know, so, so they were, they, they landed them, and the submarine that landed them actually got, got stuck on a sandbar, and then it, went, it got off, and then it came in down to sink a ship off New Jersey. But they deployed uh, a lot of soldiers along the coast once they caught these guys. And uh, they took a whole regiment of New Jersey National Guard guys who had been called up in 1940, the 113th Infantry, and they stretched them out between Long Island and Delaware. There were like every few miles, there was a company of soldiers. And then they gave the, the Coast Guard submachine guns. Then they gave them horses, because the cavalry was demobilizing. You know, there were no more horses, so they, what they ended with the horses, they gave them to the Coast Guard, and they used them to patrol the beaches. And we have that in the book, too. We went into the, it's a whole chapter on the home front and how people remember it from the time. <clears throat> now, there were also air raids. Now, we know a lot about the Navy and the Navy's claiming that uh, the, the, the lights on the, on the boardwalk uh, helped the German submariners, and that's not really true. Um, but, you know, we know a lot about what happened because that's Governor Charles Edison on the right there. And his father was the famous inventor, Thomas. And he was the, he was the, uh, the governor, and every week he would have a war cabinet meeting in Trenton. And through that meeting would come the head of the state police, the head of the civil defense, some guys from the legislature, a National Guard officer, and they would talk, talk about the home front. And he was convinced that German bombers might come here. It seems silly in retrospect, but if you go to West Orange to the Edison Labs, as an underground bunker, it's he built to put his father's papers in back then. But here he is in Newark, and the mayor of Newark is showing him where all the air raid sirens are. And they wanted, they wanted a blackout inland, which was impossible in some places because they had war industries going and the furnaces are going 24 hours a day. The Navy never requested a blackout on the beach. They requested a dim out and they were vague about what it meant. So the governor tells the chief of the head of the state police and the head of the civil defense, take a boat up and down the shore and see what you can see. The Navy's bitching to me about you know, there's too many lights out there. So they say, well, they come back and report. They say, well, there's some light coming out of Atlantic City. But this is like, you know, the middle of winter. Asbury Park is totally blacked out, they say. And they said, there's one place on the coast that's lit up like a Christmas tree. And where's that? It's the Navy base at Cape May. <laughs> and then the state police guy says, you know, we gave out 10 summonses for guys driving with their headlights facing the ocean last week. Six of them were the Navy officers. So, so it's debatable. You know, after the war, the, the, the Navy had a historian, Samuel Elliott Morrison, a famous American historian, and they made him an admiral, and he wrote a, a very commendable 10-volume history of the Navy in World War II. But when it came to the, the coastal submarine thing, he, he, he believed what they told him, and it wasn't really the case, not from what I've been able to see. So, okay, there were other morale builders, too. They had a place up in uh, Gladstone where if your ship was torpedoed and you survived, you could go up there for a little R&R &R and hang out. And it's visited by the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Of course, the British wanted to keep the Duke of Windsor as far away from Britain as they could because of his pre-war affiliation with some characters in Germany. So I think they, well, they make him governor of Bermuda or something. And he came up here with his wife, the Duchess, and they signed autographs for these seamen up in Gladstone. And this, I just put this in because it's very cute. Uh, this is the guy, the governor who succeeds Edison, Wally Edge. Wally is the only guy, he's governor of New Jersey during two wars. He was governor of World War I, and he was governor during World War II. At any rate, he is, this little girl is, has been chosen to be the pinup girl for the USS New Jersey. And she's terrified of him, obviously. <laughs> and, uh, as it turns out, I know a guy who went to high school with her. <laughs> so, but uh, I just, I, I love that picture. You can make a whole collection of politicians scaring babies photos. <laughs> I have three or four of them. Uh, all right, and another home front thing, the Bradley, Bradley Beach, some of the merchants from there in Ashbury Park. 
put together what they call the Dad's Club, which meant uh, that soldiers and sailors on leave could go there and meet their families and relax. And they set up an apprenticeship program for after the war to get these guys into the trades and did, did what they could. So as I said, in 1942, the beaches were strewn with oil and wreckage, right? The last WPA job was to clean up the Jersey beaches, and they did. And in 1943, this is Bradley Beach. So it's not, and the second lady from the left is my mother-in-law. <laughs> Old family photos, and they were from down here, so. But you can see it's not, although balls, you still found balls of oil and stuff even into many years later. One guy I know was a 12-year-old kid at the time and went down to a lifeboat, broken lifeboat on the beach and fished around and came up with a 45 caliber automatic pistol. He said his mother used to keep kerosene in the back porch and he and his sister had to clean, they were in Spring Lake, they had to clean their feet off before they came in because there was so much oil on the beaches. There's Ocean Grove in, in, in 1944, nice and quiet. And then there's this guy. He's the last. Remember I told you about the guys who landed on Long Island in Florida? He's in Newark. He's the guy they're supposed to meet. Meet a uh, guy, Krepper, who had been a Lutheran minister, but he was a bookkeeper for a bar in Newark at the time. And he was supposed to supply them with housing and places uh, and money. And once they captured all these guys and then they got onto him and they finally, they finally nailed them. And he spent about 10 years in jail, I think, after the war. But he was an American citizen, actually. Uh, <clears throat> and that's how we end. <laughs>